Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to do a quick review of The Outsiders by S.E. Hinton. So I'm going to quickly read the blurb and then I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the book before I go through and actually check my notes. So, growing up on the mean streets of 60s America is tough. Ponyboy is only 14 and since his parents died in a car crash, big brother Darry has struggled to bring him up properly. But Pony's real family is his gang, a bunch of tough guys who watch out for each other. The gang aren't there when two smooth rich kids attack Pony and his friend Johnny. Johnny pulls a knife and he and Pony find themselves on the run. They are real outsiders now and only a dramatic twist of fate can save them. So, I think this is something of a modern classic really. I, and I also think it's probably better known in America than here in the UK. Maybe because it's partly American culture I suppose. Basically it follows the, the kind of the clashes between the greasers and the socias, that's how you say them apparently, although it's, it's spelled socks, S-O-C-S, but I read in here somewhere it's pronounced socias, so we're going to go with that. So yeah, this is 1967 it's dated, and basically the greasers are the poorer kids, they have kind of longer hair, and then the socias are the richer kids, and they kind of tend to have like Beatles haircuts, and they're wearing designer gear and all that stuff. And so they like to fight each other on the streets. Now, Essie Hinton wrote this book when she herself was only 17 and she was going out with a greaser. And I guess she kind of wrote it as a bit of a cautionary tale. But it's also very much like a coming of age story, but it's got that nice little bit of gangsterism in there. Uh, Pony Boy as well, who's Pony Boy Curtis, the main character, is just very almost philosophical. Like... He's a greaser, but he shouldn't really be a greaser, really. And th and that's explored a lot in this book, is the distinctions between these two groups. And for me, it reminded me of where I grew up. We had the Chavs and the Grebos. So the Chavs, my, my British friends will know what a Chav is, but for you Americans, a Chav, it was always said that Chav was an acronym for Council House and Violent. And then the Grebos were like the kids who had like the long greasy hair, they were listening to like grunge. And then uh, this was like before the emo movement. So it was all the people who listened to grunge and then, you know, heavy rock and metal and maybe Slipknot and stuff like that. All of them all had the long hairs and wearing black and stuff. And it kind of encompassed the goths and the rockers and all that little group. Those were the Grebos. So we were always Chavs versus Grebos, and this is obviously Greasers versus Socks. Uh, Socias, sorry. Oh no, I said it wrong. This was really interesting for me because even though it's set in 1960s America, the actu it was actually quite relatable. I mean, I never got in for the whole, you know, organised fighting kind of thing. I'm a lover, not a fighter. I'm a pacifist, in fact. So, um, but I did get beat up several times by Chavs, and and in this. The, uh, the greasers are constantly getting jumped by the socias, who basically jump them just because that's what socias do. They fight. The two groups fight each other. It's what's always been done and what's always will be done. Before I go into this as well, a little context of why I picked this up, because I think context always is always useful. So, basically, they made a movie out of this, and it's kind of an all-star cast. Rob Lowe, Ralph Macchio, and 16 others. Well, I'm pretty sure Tom Cruise was in it as well, wasn't he? I don't know. Anyway, there was a film made out of it. And I actually worked on the Wikipedia page for a museum that is based where the house was for the film, if that makes sense. So uh, Danny Boy O'Connor, who used to be in House of Pain, really randomly, he's a massive S.E. Hinton fan, a big fan of The Outsiders. And so he bought the old house that was used for the filming, and then he's turning it into a museum for the film and for the book, which is very cool. So I'd already heard of it through that, but I've never heard of any of my British reader friends or anything ever mention this book. And then Catalyst Reads here on YouTube picked it up and he gave it a good review. And he was like, I'll be surprised if you give it less than a four star review. Spoiler alert for what my rating is at the end. He was not wrong. He was not wrong. <laughs> I love this. I thought it was great. I'm going to go in and, and uh, bring out some of my, my sticky note tabs. Oh God. Okay, my sticky notes. One slight problem. They have literally pulled the writing away from the page. Oh dear. But some great description of, um, of uh, Soda Pop. Oh, actually, that's before before we get really in. So, in the movie, the problem that I had, and I did watch the movie first, and I kind of regret that now, but in the movie, I found it hard to remember who was who and, you know, what their personalities were and all that stuff. And I had no problem with it here. And um, I think Ponyboy Curtis is my favourite of the characters, but Soda Pop Curtis was his older brother, and he's got some great description of him here. So, he has dad's eyes, but Soda is one of a kind. He can get drunk in a drag race or dancing without ever getting near alcohol. In our neighbourhood, it's rare to find a kid who doesn't drink once in a while. But Soda never touches a drop. He doesn't need to. He gets drunk on just plain living. And he understands everybody. 
I think the way the characters were described in the book is what really brought them to life more so than the film could ever do, you know. I like some of the descriptions of the girls here as well. And um, <laughs> it's the kind of girl I find attractive, unfortunately. But he says, I thought of Sylvia and Evie and Sandy and two bits many blondes. They were the only kind of girl that would look at us, I thought. Tough, loud girls who wore too much eye makeup and giggled and swore too much. I liked Soda's girl, Sandy, just fine though. Her hair was natural blonde and her laugh was soft like her china blue eyes. She didn't have a real good home or anything and was our kind, a greaser, but she was a real nice girl. Still, lots of times I wondered what other girls were like. The girls who were bright eyed and had their dresses a decent length and acted as if they'd like to spit on us if given a chance. Some were afraid of us and remembering Dallas Winston, I didn't blame them. But most looked at us like we were dirt, gave us the same kind of look that the socias did when they came by in their Mustangs and Corvairs and yelled GREASE at us. I wondered about them, the girls I mean. Did they cry when their boys were arrested like Evie did when Steve got hauled in? Or did they run out on them the same way Sylvia did Dallas? But maybe their boys didn't get arrested or beaten up or busted up in rodeos. And it just, it really brings the two sets of characters to life. One slight problem is there are characters called Daryl and Dallas, I believe their names were. But they both get shortened to Darry and Dally. And it, it was doing my head in because I could never remember which one was which. Especially when the two of them were in the same scene and they were talking to each other. I'm like, what the hell is going on? So this, I'm just going to read this short paragraph and this brings to life the Curtis household. So like I said, um, uh, Pony Boy's parents were killed in a car crash. So he lives with Soda Pop Curtis and then their older brother, the oldest, which is Darry Curtis, I believe. Yeah, yeah, Darry, yeah. So it says here, I looked through the door. Soda Pop was giving Darry a back rub. Darry is always pulling muscles. He roofs houses and he's always trying to carry two bundles of roofing up the ladder. I knew Soda would put him to sleep because Soda can put about anyone out when he sets his head to it. He thought Darry worked too hard anyway. I did too. Darry didn't deserve to work like an old man when he was only 20. He had been a real popular guy in school. He was captain of the football team and he had been voted boy of the year. But we just didn't have the money for him to go to college, even with the athletic scholarship he won. And now he didn't have time between jobs to even think about college. So he never went anywhere and never did anything anymore, except work out at gyms and go skiing with some old friends of his sometimes. It's kind of shown to us later on the sacrifices that Darry actually made for his brothers. And this college thing is one of them. He probably could have gone to college. And that's why it's so senseless when the Greasers and the Socias are fighting, because Darry will fight people who he, you know, he could have been a Socia if he didn't have to worry about his little brothers, but because he did, they were greasers instead, and it just shows this like arbitrariness of, of you know, of, of the two different groups. So you can see how these divides are created, and it's really beautifully echoed here between the you know the greasers and the socias that just you know being born on a different side of town can totally change the way that you you live your life. And for a seventeen-year-old to nail it in this. Does it, where did I read that she was 17? 22nd of July 1948, and the copyright on this is 67. So it was, in, it was in print when she was 19, so I can believe she wrote it when she was 17. Nice. Then they go to a cinema and they, they get chatting to some girls and they, they don't like Dally, but they do like uh, Johnny and uh, Pony Boy, which is good because I like those two as well. They're probably one, two of my favorites. Johnny and I looked at each other. He grinned suddenly, raising his eyebrows so that they disappeared under his bangs. Would we ever have something to tell the boys, his eyes said plainly. We had picked up two girls and classy ones at that. Not any greasy broads for us, but real socias. Soda would flip when I told him. And as well, it just there's so much stuff that is more relevant now than ever, I think. So, for example, we've got this bit here where they're talking about Dallas and how horrible he is to the women. And this paragraph kind of talks about the greaser attitude towards women and particularly towards social women as well. And... It just, to me, it brings me to mind of people catcalling and this particular paragraph here just highlights the way that we can mistreat each other as human beings, I suppose. But I think more so now in terms of some of the discussions we're having, in terms of like some of the, you know, sexual assault allegations that are coming out and the Me Too movement and all this stuff. Bear in mind this was written in 67. He'd leave you alone if he knew you, I said, and that was true. When Steve's cousin from Kansas came down, Dally was decent to her and watched his swearing. We all did around nice girls who were the cousinly type. I don't know how to explain it. We tried to be nice to the girls we see once in a while, like cousins or the girls in class, but we still watch a nice girl go by on a street corner and say all kinds of lousy stuff about her. Don't ask me why. 
I don't know why. There's so much stuff here that is so relevant today, that, like to, to different attitudes and stuff. So he says here, just a little one-liner. Incidentally, we don't mind being called greaser by another greaser. It's kind of playful then. Kind of reminds me of the word. You know what word I'm talking about, so I'm not going to say it. I'm not going to say it. One thing that took me by surprise as well. It, so in the movie, obviously, it's a house that they go to. And in the book, they go to an abandoned church. So this is after, I think it's covered in the on the blurb, yeah. Johnny pulls a knife and he and Pony find themselves on the run. And in the in the movie, they find themselves locked up in this house. And in the book, it's a church. Just minor difference there for you. There is also just one tiny thing. So Johnny goes out to get some supplies and he leaves a note that says, went to get supplies, be back soon, JC. And obviously that highlighted me to the initials JC and Jesus Christ. I am a non-believer, I am a heathen. But if you want to believe in God, Believe in God. That was a minor tangent. But it's interesting because, spoiler alert, Johnny dies. Johnny also kills somebody. So it's like Jesus died for our sins. Johnny, with the same initials as Jesus, also died for our sins. And killed somebody for them as well. There's a great bit as well when they're on the run and they're like, oh, we don't want people to be able to see us, so they have to cut their hair. And obviously they're greasers, so their hair is pretty much part of their identity. And it kind of explores that in terms of the dialogue they have with each other and how they feel about having to cut their hair off. And even in terms of how other people react to it, actually, when they finally see them. They spend some time reading Gone With The Wind, which I think is great. I mean, these two little, basically these two little gangsters, you know, they're carrying knives around and stuff, and they're sitting there reading Gone With The Wind by Margaret Mitchell, is it? Well, probably. I mean, this is a great way of explaining, again, of characterizing these characters. So we're talking about Johnny here. Johnny had failed a year in school and never made good grades. He couldn't grasp anything that was shoved at him too fast. And I guess his teachers thought he was just plain dumb, but he wasn't. He was just a little slow to get things and he liked to explore things once he did get them. And then it says, I, of them reading Gone With The Wind, it says he was especially stuck on the Southern gentlemen, impressed with their manners and charm. And then he says, he, he kind of compares that to Dally, who had uh, Dallas, who, He's a bit of a dickhead, to be honest. He's one of the greasers who is actually a wrong one. Like, you start to see here in this book that not all of them are bad, but some of them are bad, and then it, I guess it kind of explores how the bad lead the good astray, and sort of things like that. I mean, Dallas starts carrying a heater, which is slang for a gun, which I love. I've not heard that before. So uh, this is a quote from Tuba. He says, You ought to see Kathy's brother. Now there's a hood. He's so greasy, he glides when he walks. He goes to the barber for an oil change, not a haircut. It's <laughs> just cracking me up. Johnny ends up in hospital, which is really sad, and his mother goes to see him. And um, basically, all throughout, he's kind of, he kind of doesn't like his parents, and he wants to escape from them. And I guess eventually he does in his own sad way. So I'll just read this paragraph, I think. As we walked out into the hall, we saw Johnny's mother. I knew her. She was a little woman with straight black hair and big eyes like Johnny's. But that was as far as the resemblance went. Johnny Cake's eyes were fearful and sensitive. Hers were cheap and hard. As we passed her, she was saying, but I have a right to see him. He's my son. After all the trouble his father and I have gone to raise him. This is our reward. He'd rather see those no-count hoodlums than his own folks. She saw us and gave us such a look of hatred that I almost backed up. It was your fault, always running around in the middle of the night getting jailed and heaven knows what else. I thought she was going to cuss us out. I really did. Two bits eyes got narrow and I was afraid he was going to start something. I don't really like to hear women get sworn at, even if they deserve it. No wonder he hates your goods, too bit snapped. So here we get a little thing where uh, Daryl ends up fighting one of the socias who was a former friend of his. So I heard Soda give a kind of squeak and I realised that the blonde was Paul Holden. He'd been the best halfback on Darry's football team at high school and he and Darry used to buddy it around all the time. He must be a junior in college by now, I thought. He was looking at Darry with an expression I couldn't quite place but disliked. Contempt? Pity? Hate? All three? Why? Because Darry was standing there representing all of us, and maybe Paul felt only contempt and pity and hate for greasers. Darry hadn't moved a muscle or changed expression, but you could see he hated Paul now. It wasn't only jealousy. Darry had a right to be jealous. He was ashamed to be on our side, ashamed to be seen with the Brumley boys, Shepherd's Gang, maybe even us. Nobody realised it but me and Soda. It didn't matter to anyone but me and Soda. And again, it just underlines the whole senselessness of all of this violence and kind of the futility of it all as well. Dally Winston commits suicide by cop, which is pretty brave to include in a 1967 book, I feel. It's kind of sad as well. Again, senseless, pointless. He didn't have to die, but he just wanted to. Then we have here, and I should note here as well before we get into it, that he hates baloney for some reason. So uh, this paragraph is sort of after the events of the novel, really, as it's wrapping up. I wish I could say that everything went back to normal, but it didn't, especially me. 
I started running into things, like the door, and kept tripping over the coffee table and losing things. I always have been kind of absent-minded, but man, then, I was lucky if I got home from school with a right notebook and with both shoes on. I walked all the way home once in my stocking feet and didn't even notice it until Steve made some bright remark about it. I guess I'd left my shoes in the locker room at school, but I never did find them. And another thing, I quit eating. I used to eat like a horse, but all of a sudden I wasn't hungry. Everything tasted like bologna. I was lousing up my schoolwork too. I didn't do badly in maths because Darry checked over my homework in that and usually caught all my mistakes and made me do it again. But in English, I really washed out. I used to make A's in English, mostly because my teacher made us do compositions all the time. I mean, I know I don't talk good English. Have you ever seen a HUD that did? But I can write it good when I try. At least I could before. Now I was lucky to get a D on composition. And then it gets really confusing for a little while because he starts... He thinks himself that it was him that killed the kid and not Johnny. And then it seems as though the socias also believe that. Um, for about four or five pages, it was just as if I'd fallen through this rabbit hole where suddenly he's done it. And then it comes back a few pages later and it's like, oh no, it was Johnny. And that really confused me. And I didn't, I didn't really know what was going on there. I, maybe I missed something, I'm not sure. And I also predicted the ending as well, because basically he gets, after that bit about him talking about his composition class, he basically gets given an assignment to write about anything that he wants. And so the end of the book starts the way the start of it begins. And it's kind of revealed that it's Ponyboy himself who has written the book. And I kind of knew that was coming. And I must admit, it's been overdone now. Maybe it was a bit more revolutionary back then. But it was, it was a depressingly predictable ending for... When you've got to bear in mind, it's, I'm pre pretty sure that's different to the movie, and so I didn't know that was how it was going to end. But you could still see it coming, and, and that's a shame, really. But still, all in all, this was great. I really enjoyed it. I heartily recommend going out and reading it if you haven't already. I think it's something that everyone should read at least once. It's got some great stuff in there about everything from redemption to identity to, you know, the class system. And just to... I like how a lot of it is just so so pointless, like such a pointless waste of talent and life and youth. And it's kind of bleak in that way, but it does give you hope as well. So yeah, for that, I'm gonna give it a 4.5 out of five. Very close to a five star. There were one or two things that I didn't like about it and I couldn't wrap my head around. But other than that, fantastic. And I heartily recommend you go and check it out. So yeah. So anyway, thanks a lot for watching. Don't forget to leave a comment to let me know if you've read this book and if so, what you thought about it. If you have read this book, let me know who your favorite character is as well. And if not, perhaps you've seen the movie, who knows? In the meantime, please do hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit subscribe if you haven't already, and I will see you soon for more bookish videos. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.